welcome to this Green Kite vlog where today we're talking about digital promotions. Is it the new compliance must do? And joining me today, uh, we have um, our Green Kite CEO and founder, Sara Aja. And also we have digital promotions guru. I'm going to call you that, Claire, if that's OK. <laughs> uh, our very own experienced, uh, hugely experienced um, insurance compliance and business growth expert, Claire Carpenter. Welcome, Claire. Great to have you here. Hi, Sean. Thank you. Yeah, really great to be here. Can't wait to talk to you about all things digital promotions. So, Sarah, hi and welcome. Can you just share a little bit about yourself um, with our viewers and listeners, please? Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me this morning. Um, for all of those out there who don't know me, I'm Sarah Aja. I'm the CEO of Green Kite Associates, and I'm delighted to be here this morning with Sean and Claire, my colleagues, and we're going to be talking to you about digital promotion. So um, a topic close to my heart and one for all of those in techs out there. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Claire. So now let's get on with the conversation. Let's let's start off then, Claire, and I'm going to come to you first with with this question. Uh, so brace yourself. Okay. Um, so as I've said, you're a highly experienced um, expert in compliance insurance, and you've got a special interest and expertise in digital promotion. So can you give us an overview of the kind of issues you've seen, are seeing in and with firms in the work that you've done, and You've worked with a whole range of clients, different sizes and shapes and so forth. But are there some common issues that you're seeing as you look across the piece of around digital promotions? What, what are the kinds of issues that you're seeing and any common threads in there? Yeah, a very interesting area, particularly at the moment with the advent of insurtechs um, and a lot more MGAs entering the market. What what tend to be seeing is actually a, a disconnect quite often between what the insurer wants to cover and what the MGAs think uh, is, is being covered. And I think that that posing quite a big issue just in terms of kind of the clarity for consumers and what they're buying and actually what that back end process is going to look like. So, you know, a lot of a lot of firms at the moment are, are leading on the sort of value proposition of claims and hassle-free um, and actually the realities of those those processes aren't as uh, often as described and not necessarily because um, in, you know individuals doing anything wrong in that respect but mainly because actually they don't understand the claims journey it may be run by the insurer or another third party and there's no real kind of cohesion between the start to finish life cycle of the product you know from policy wording to claims complaints process to the to the sales journey and those sort of inconsistencies in understanding actually are, are coming out um, and causing complaints and causing um, customer friction. And I think as you know, consumer duty uh, rules come in and start to bed in, I think it's going to be critically important to assess the entire life cycle of that product and ensure that the insurers, MGAs and all of the service providers are, are on the same message, same tone of voice, have the same um, understanding of what the product wants. It's great to have aspirational desires for how the product delivers, but actually is that re the reality and firm should really be thinking about ensuring those consistencies across the customer journey not just at the bit that they're responsible for yeah it's really interesting isn't it so do you do you does it feel to you like it's kind of symptomatic of risks that, of that sort of disconnection that lack of kind of an overall view from from start to finish of how the promise and the brand ethos actually matches up to the delivery at all stages so that's been an issue, hasn't it? In, in insurance, it's always been a risk, hasn't it? In, in insurance, with it being such an exploded value chain and so many different people, because of our business models, involved in servicing customer, developing products, delivering against claims and so forth. So it's been there for a long time. But do you feel like with the advent of, of digital technology, particularly as it pertains to fast moving channels like TikTok and other social channels, do you think that that has kind of, is that creating new issues or is it new um, examples of that same old problem of a, of a lack of connectedness? Um, Claire, what do you think? Well, I think I've, I've worked personally and as a consultant for big insurers and I've also worked for, you know, uh, and with MGAs um, looking at that more digital stuff. There's a reason why big insurers steer away from things like TikTok. Um, you know, they have very uh, robust um, financial promotions processes and very kind of risk averse about what they want to say about the product. And there's a reason reason for that. Now, the MGAs and the, the insure techs moving in the market quite rightly want to utilise those mediums um, and have great ideas 
ideas and great um, great ethos is. However, they haven't necessarily got the understanding around the, the financial promotion rules and the, the implications of that. I mean, we've seen uh, a number of uh, TikTok adverts that, you know, advising customers, you know, the, the individual um, influencers or, or person on the doing the TikTok video actually doesn't necessarily have the correct authorizations. Let's not forget and let's remember that introductions for insurance is regulated activity unless you benefit from an exemption. And I don't think that's fully understood. And I don't think that the um the videos go through the same rigor as you they would do um through you know one of the big insurers with well established financial promotions processes. Now there's a there's a converse to that you know the big insurers are not as innovative and as not you know not attacking that target market quite as uh, well as they could be um, but equally there is some security um, in, in not doing those things so um, you know at the moment I think the insurtechs are leading the way and the MGAs are leading the way but this thing these need to add up um, and they need to take the experience from the insurers and you know these well-groomed processes but push the envelope uh, a bit more but but taking on you know both sides of that coin. Yeah super thank you so much so, Sarah, we've heard from Claire on the range of issues and the kinds of firms, um, digitalization of customer acquisition and using channels like TikTok are clearly creating specific issues. But how far do you think this is also really just part and parcel of getting compliance properly prioritized in the business? So firstly, Claire, thank you. Um, very interesting. And yeah, I agree wholeheartedly in everything you said, um, very succinctly put. So, so Sean, I think there's a, you, you're right, this is just about compliance going forward. And you know, uh, here at Green Kite, what we say about compliance is it's, it's, it should be part and parcel of your business. So, you know, a couple of things spring to mind when I was thinking about what Claire had to say just then, and that's the external and the internal risks that the business face if they don't do it right. So, you know, I think thus far, um, as, as Claire's hinted at, the regulator has stayed clear or stayed away from TikTok. They're busy looking at financial promotions and other more pressing issues. And the reason they've probably done that is because the volume of users out there at the moment remains small, however, not insignificant. So it's very easy for you to be tracked and traced uh, using a, a platform like TikTok, just because the number of people out there are as small as I say. Um, and I think one needs to be concerned or, or just aware that you do run the risk of being used as an example firm if you make mistakes using that kind of platform. And that, that for me is a, a huge external risk and something that we should all be mindful of. Internally, as I say, um, when you're trying to grow or scale your business or develop your business, it's all about having the right infrastructural support, isn't it? It's about those processes, those policies, those sign-offs, those controls, those, those approvals. And I think if you don't have or haven't thought about new vehicles and platforms and ways of doing things, then you may not have those right checks and balances in place. And therefore, what you will end up doing is having great marketing literature, but if it breaches the regulations, there'll be huge amounts of time, management concern and risk to the business if you don't do it right. So, you know, getting it right from the outset is what we should always be trying to do, not being found out or caught out by the regulator. So sorry, just following up on that a little bit. So do you, is, it, is it your view or your experience that in businesses where compliance is already viewed as an integral part of growth, of making sure the business can do what it wants to do, that in theory anyway, firms who are set up like that, and arguably they may well be the more established firms, right? Um, if they're already, compliance is already seen as that sort of essential business partner, do you think they're better positioned? to be in a good pace, to be regulator ready on the, on these issues, or, or would you worry perhaps about a, some slight complacency or not? So, I mean, yes and no, and I, I'm not sitting on the fence because that isn't what I like to do, but I think absolutely, if compliance is part and integrity your business, then you're less likely to, to make fundamental, fundamental breaches when you're looking at this kind of thing. However, this is a new arena. And actually, it's a new area and marketeers haven't necessarily been trained, or actually even have the insight at the moment. So even if you have the right checks and balances for other platforms, they may need to be changed for this new medium. So I, I, I think 
Yes, absolutely. Having a compliance person who's party and sits within your business is key, but doesn't mean that you will still do it right, because actually the whole point about compliance and regulation is keeping up with the rules. And that to me is that is the point here that you need to keep up with those rules as they change. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. That's really, really interesting. Thank you for that. So to both of you now, then um, coming to you first, Claire. Obviously, you're an absolute expert in compliance, but actually, really, what that means is that you're really expert in helping delegated authority firms on, on any side of that delegated relationship, right, to really grow as fast and sustainably as they could and should. I mean, I think that's what I see from the work that I, that I know that you've done, top line. So you have the C-suite or the leadership um, of an established um, in a principal insurer or capacity provider who's thinking about their delegated relationships on this side and you have the recipients the other side of that delegated authority uh, relationship those growth oriented firms as you say insure techs and other types of mgas um, sat in front of you and they're saying claire please tell us what does getting ahead of the regulatory curve in this instance of digital promotions and digital customer acquisition, what does that actually mean? So Claire, what should be on there to do, to think, to action list? Well, I think it's interesting you started with the C-suite of uh, insurers, because I think a lot of times, in particular at the moment, when we look at sort of contents insurance and gadget and those types of products, actually insurers see themselves as a capacity provider in most cases. Um, and I think that's pretty dangerous in the context if you've got these very smart, innovative um, MGAs and insurtechs really wanting to run and kind of increase growth. But it is a viable um, distribution method for, for insurers. And I think the key is actually partnering with somebody that you can have a proper conversation with it you can understand you know the insurers desires and needs and right down into the policy wording I mean the policy wordings in my opinion have, have needed a revamp for for many years in plain language and really say what you mean because I think there's so many uh, exclusions and clauses and policy wording that don't even make sense to the insurers to be able to articulate so I think it starts with that product build and actually getting into bed with an MGA and a, a distribution partner that actually really understands what the insurers need um, in terms of kind of risk um, risk premium um, but also in terms of uh, their risk appetite and making sure that that's cohesively aligned you know, you've both got to want the same thing you both got to understand each other's uh, motivations and strategy and I think that's the it starts at that sort of um, initial um, uh, contracting stage find the right partner make sure you're expressing all of your your goals and your desires and that you 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 engage with the insurers far too often these are so removed yes the contract signed and then over to the mga and off they go um, and there isn't enough oversight from the insurers and also i think a lot of times having worked for um an insurer you feel like you you, you can't ask you can't be too involved because they're that's their area and that's their their bag so i think very much that that first initial conversation right the way through the customer journey what do we want from each step of this how are we going to achieve both of our objectives um, and that's critical and quite frankly that doesn't happen now okay and so who in the bis various businesses should be involved in that conversation i mean obviously the compliance experts either in the business or through typically as we know new and scaling businesses tend to outsource their compliance expertise so if it's those outsourced experts as well so we've got in the room having that sort of breakdown and alignment of what do we want and how are we going to make that work we have the compliance experts who else needs to be in that room claire in terms of functions do you think so yeah, I think in terms of the insurers, I don't you know certainly from um, the companies I've worked for, the you know the the partnerships team um, from the insurance perspective, I've, I've, you know pretty pretty experienced, pretty well qualified on a lot of the, the compliance angles. Uh, I don't think compliance should be leading many of those conversations. Generally speaking, you know, uh, I get this phrase at me all the time, compliance doesn't run a business. Um, and if we did, there probably wouldn't be one. Um, and I think that's I think that's Do you quite think that's fair, Claire. Do you think that's fair? I don't think it's fair for me, obviously, but um, no. <laughs> I do think that if you start from a uh, from a compliance perspective, actually, you're going to stifle innovation before before it gets started. I think it's important actually to work out what you want, where you want to get, and then compliance help facilitate that in, in a compliant way. Um, so I think you know, from my experience, the, the partnerships team at most insurers are. are, are 
pretty on the money. I mean, they've been beaten up by compliance uh, for, for many years in most cases um, and actually do know what, what should be happening. Now, once you've got a fully realised vision and, and a good compliance, people should be involved in that discussion to some extent. But then actually you work out how you can do that compliantly with, with compliance. But uh, I think that generally speaking, actually, let's get the, the brains on the on the proposition and then get compliance in to, to help support and make that, um, to you know, deliver that in a safe and, and compliant way. So thanks so much, Claire, for that. And, and Sarah, coming to you, just a reminder of, of, of what the question is here, I guess. Um, obviously, you've been, you're hugely experienced in helping all aspects of the delegated authority relationship um, work and work really well over a number of years. What's your advice to the firm's leadership on the regulator's attitude to digital promotions, whether that firm is a, an established capacity provider or principal or an established MGA? And I guess maybe particularly, perhaps arguably to those digital first MGAs and, and ARs that we see so frequently in our work at Green Kite. What, what should they be bearing in mind on the, on the regulator's attitude and, and what might getting ahead of that regulatory curve actually practically mean that they might think about, do, <coughs> excuse me, get, get more focused on as a result of, of listening to you and Claire on this vlog? So all I would say is, uh, adding on what both you guys have observed, is that actually um, TikTok and other social media create huge market potential they are a huge advantage to any business established state scaling um ones that have embraced digitalization those who are just embarking on a digital journey i think this space is is huge the most the most important thing is to leverage the the possibility in the right ways and then you can gain pure advantage over your competitors. The distribution channels are immense and the relative cost of using this kind of platform is pretty inexpensive. But one needs to just be mindful that you do invest in the right areas before you embark. And that probably means, I would say this, wouldn't I, that you get the right advice before you do this kind of marketing exercise. So your, your top tip would be then to call Green Kite. Is that what you're saying? I might like to say that yes absolutely Sean. well there's there's uh, there aren't that many people because i think not only is this new for firms but this is also new for advisors so actually those of us who are able to to help firms in this way are pretty few and far between at the moment so be careful who you partner with just as much as be careful how you advertise using these platforms that would be my word of caution so all that remains um on this Green Kite Vlog is to say thank you so much to our vloggers today, including Claire Carpenter. Claire, thanks so much. That was absolutely awesome. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, Sarah, a last word from you. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution this morning. And uh, what can we look forward to um, from Green Kite in other areas as, as we go into the summer? So um, Green Kite is uh, here to stay in the delegated space. We love all things new. Um, we like to be challenged by our clients um, and we'd love to hear more and be able to support some of you in digital marketing. Indeed, if you have new ventures and you need help and support, then please do reach out. Um, we should know the answer and if we don't, then we'll find out for you. It's been a real pleasure this morning and I hope you found this vlog useful. Thanks so much. So that's the end of this Green Kite vlog talking to you about digital promotions and being regulator ready. See you on the next time.